mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loose. God, we believe. Yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. And bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. Oh, God, we believe. Yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. We are here. Just tell them today. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. 
We set our hearts on you. Come and do what you do. Cause this is a move. This is a move. We believe. This is a move. You're moving right here, right now. This is a move. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who God who pleads, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the Son of
y'all are seated, we want to share a really powerful story with you. Y'all take a moment to look at these screens right now. There's a lot of great qualities about, he's, he's taught me to be a really loving, loving person. So he's, he's awesome, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You are. He's awesome. I love him. I graduated from Florida State in 1988, and um, I was a member of a church, and I decided that it would be a good thing to play in handbell choir, and I was C7, and Lydia was C6, and it was love at first sight, except she thought I was kind of obnoxious. And he asked me out on a date, and um, eventually we did go out on that date, and within a month, um, we were in love. And I can remember on the way home that um, this was gonna, this was gonna be the woman I was gonna marry. After two years of being married, uh, we planned a pregnancy, and I got pregnant. And along comes Curtis, um, and about nine or ten months, I think, in, into it. Uh, Lydia calls me at school, had a bad, um, bad doctor's appointment. <clears throat> and she said, you know, you need to come out, we need to talk about Curtis. The doctors wanted to run some more tests, the skull didn't look quite right, and so they, they uh, decided that they would send us to All Children's Hospital, which as a young 26-year-old dad, uh, that was a really scary thing for us, and that's kind of when we started to realize that, that this wasn't a normal kind of, um, kind of childhood. At age five, we were buying him toys that said zero to nine months or six to 18 months. That was not the age for a five-year-old, but those were the toys that he loved. When we moved to Fort Myers, I had a dream job, but the school system was giving us a lot of problems with the size of classes, and the ratio in Florida was 25 kids of all different uh, levels of cognition and one teacher, and when we came to Atlanta, it was eight kids, a teacher, and a para pro. So with no job, one friend, uh, we put our house on the market, and I resigned from my position, and we got on our knees and started praying and hoped that that God would show us the way. And God opened the door wide open, and we ended up here in Atlanta. Barriers in a, in a child's life with special needs um, begin at school, but surprisingly, they can also be at church. And I remember one church in particular, the people said to Jim, we don't really know where Curtis would fit in and Curtis was like five years old. We were just so upset. I think the heart is always there. I think that people want to help, but they just don't have the physical uh, space to do it. They don't have the teachers to do it. And so 
then where does he go? A lot of families end up staying at home, not having a place to go because there's just no place for a special needs adult to fit. For the first time really in our lives, we were not going to church. And, and that has been very difficult to either find churches that are accepting of him or churches that are capable and willing to take him in. And so one day at school, I had a student come and ask me for a recommendation letter to work in the special needs ministry at this church called Westridge. And so we Googled Westridge Church and the first picture we saw in there were the Wheelers. And uh, the Wheelers are good friends of ours. From the moment that we drove through the parking lot, there's just greeters everywhere as you're walking through the door and they are so friendly. The worship time was great, the sermon was great. Curtis went to Out of the Box, which is the special needs program, and they were so nice and so welcoming. It felt like we were walking in as a typical family. We didn't get the glances, we didn't get the stares, and, and a lot of times you never feel anonymous. Everywhere you go, there's an eye on you. You, you, you feel like people are watching you, and we, I didn't feel that way at all. And we just knew that that was gonna be our church. There are so many families that are not in church because they can't go. And it's, they, they can't go not because they don't have transportation, but once they get there, there's no place for them, for their family to worship, no place for their special needs person. If Westridge is able to invest in a facility and volunteers that takes that problem out of the equation, I think the doors are gonna be busting wide open with hundreds of families that would wanna be a part of this church. No question in my mind. God doesn't make any mistakes. And often as, you, as we navigate through life, uh, people will look upon a family like ours with pity. And on the outside, it may appear that way, but but our son Curtis knows the gospel at the very basic and, and most innocent way. And I feel like we've been totally blessed because God's plan for us is being shown to us each day and each step of Curtis's life. Hey, Westridge family, would you please give a warm welcome to me to Curtis's dad, Jim Palmer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for doing that for me, because I appreciate that for him. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for being willing to share your story with us. Thank you just so much for teaching us uh, really what it means to care for and love on families like yours. You've been so helpful, you and Lydia and your whole family, so just thank you for that. You know, we filmed that story uh, about four years ago, 2018, and boy, a lot has happened since 2018. I wonder if you would just kind of share with us what it's been like, particularly for special needs families in the last couple of years, how things have been for you and your family. Well, uh, the last couple of years for all of us have been crazy, hasn't it, with the pandemic? And you probably felt very trapped. And special needs families feel like that all the time. We, we sometimes always feel trapped. But particularly after the pandemic, there everything was taken away and it was very difficult to function in the community and was just a very big challenge in our lives. When we had a chance to talk the other day, you said something to me that was... Um, uh, that was really important. You said, you know, you feel like the time for us to uh, to build this thing is right now. Will you tell me uh, and tell all of us again why you feel like this is so important that we go forward with this project right now? Well, right now we need it. The special needs families need to be connected to church, and it's not just a special needs person. It's their siblings. It's their parents. I'm going to tell you, when God opens those doors, a floodgate in this community are going to come to our church and they're going to be ministered to the special needs person, the siblings who need to be here with us, and the parents who also need to be here with us. And you also shared with us how important it was from your perspective that every one of our families participate uh, in helping make this space a reality. Will you share with us why you feel that? You have an awesome opportunity when that building opens to say, I became a part of that. I contributed to that. And uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7 says, God loves a cheerful giver. 
And that needs to begin every every week. I love the app because I can I can give weekly whether I'm able to be here or not. But then above that, you have an opportunity now to give to the vision fund that's going to help fund this building and be a part of that special celebration when it opens. You don't want to miss that at all. I love that. Uh, so a few years ago, God put it on our hearts. There's just so many opportunities that are beyond taking care of one another and uh, with, that would be done through our tithes and offerings as a church family. So many different opportunities that we can address if we have the means to do it. And so we began this thing called the Vision Fund. We've been talking about it for several weeks. And so whether it's um, sending uh, students that couldn't otherwise afford to go to camp, uh, whether it's expanding our outreach and our reach of our YouTube channel to children all over the world, or whether it's creating a space specifically designed for special need, needs families, the Vision Fund is what helps make that happen. And our hope and our desire is that every family in Westridge, for what he just said, the reason he just gave, would be able to be a part of this. Because not only do we want to build this in faith and we believe that God has called us to do it, but we want to do it debt-free. Amen? We want to do this thing debt-free. So we really need your help. Go ahead. You can, you can clap for that. Debt-free, babe. All right. Jim, will you just do us a favor? I would love for you to pray over this building as it begins in just a couple of months. We're going to be breaking ground. Uh, will you pray over the offerings that will be given toward that the, for the Vision Fund? And then also just for our pastor as he comes um, and teaches us the Word of God this morning. Can you do that? Absolutely. Let, let us pray. Dear Lord, we just are grateful. We're grateful for the opportunity that you've given Westridge to have a place for special needs community that can come and worship as a family. What an awesome gift you're giving us. And I just pray right now that the hearts that are touched will contribute to the uh, Vision Fund so that we can see that happen right away and that we can go into that project the way you want us to do it. We are so grateful for everything that you give us. And I ask you now to, to please be with Pastor Brian as he gives his sermon today, that his words will be anointed and that your word will be spread so that we can grow closer to you each and every day. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for everything. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Uh, these guys are bringing all this stuff out here this morning. And one thing, a couple of things before we open up to the book of John chapter 15. I want you to be praying for uh, our worship pastor, Jason Chandler, right back there. It's, uh, some of you have noticed that Jason has been more back there than up here. He has a polyp on his throat with some infection. And it's just one of those things he's been put on vocal rest and there's a lot more going on there, but we just uh, prayed over him. Our elders got together between this, uh, the last service and this one and prayed over him, anointed him with oil, believing that God's going to heal him completely. So would you uh, join us in praying every day for Jason for healing? And a couple, just a couple business items. We have uh, um, our elder forms, elder nomination forms are on the table out there in the atrium at the host center. And if you know of a guy who uh, is a First Timothy... Uh, chapter 3 guy, Titus 1 kind of guy who's all in uh, with our marks of a disciple here at Westridge, love, grow, serve, share, and just a uh, committed husband, father, grandfather, could be a single guy, but uh, you want to nominate them, this is the last Sunday we're going to be doing that, so you can grab a form out there and uh, turn that in this week. Then also, uh, this coming Wednesday is the last uh, day for you to get your students signed up for Rush Camp, which is in Daytona Beach. Um, I was thinking how much money over the years Amy and I have invested in travel stuff for our boys, lessons for all these things, pitching, hitting, whatever it was. And uh, honest truth, the very best investment that we made in our kids over the years was in camp, uh, whether it was our kids' camp or our student camp, because when your kids get 25, 30, and young adults, and they get older, I mean, you want them to, to be great husbands, great wives, great parents, you know, committed followers of Jesus. And the, com the commitments and the investments that you're making right now are going to help determine what that's going to look like down the road. So I just want to encourage you to, to get your students signed up for Rush Camp. So many great things happen there, and I, it's one of my favorite weeks of the whole year. We're there with them, and uh, it's going to be a great summer. So make that happen. Well, over the years, um, we've used the word journey here at Westridge Church to describe the Christian life. Matter of fact, uh, our very first mission statement before we 
shortened it up a few years ago was this. We, we were here, we're here to help people discover a relationship with Jesus Christ and to experience the abundant life journey found only in him. And on that journey of following Jesus, as you, we, we all know, there, there are a lot of wonderful victories and mountaintop moments. There, there's also a, a lot of valleys and deserts. And there are moments and seasons where we also feel very barren and sometimes dry. There, there are times when you feel powerless or, or seasons where you're just kind of going through the motions. And maybe you're in a season like that right now and, and you can't figure out how to shake it. And you just scratch your head and you're like, Lord, I don't know what the problem is right now. For some of you, it's not a lack of effort because you're doing everything that you have been taught to do over the years. For, for some of you, it's not a lack of knowledge. You, you, you know lots of Scripture and you've tried to apply it. It's not even a lack of desire. You, you really want to grow. You want to be intimate with God. It's certainly a lot of, not a lack, uh, because of a lack of power because we know that we have been given everything that we need at that very moment that we trusted Jesus Christ to be our Savior. So, what's the issue? Why do we have these moments in our lives where we just feel so barren and so empty and sometimes so powerless and purposeless? Well, the problem doesn't lie in the source of our strength. Our problem lies in our understanding of what it takes to connect to that source. If you remember from a few weeks ago, Jesus is sitting uh, around a table with all of his disciples and he's eating a meal that would be later known as the Last Supper. And Jesus makes this huge announcement to his disciples. He tells them that he's going to be leaving. He's going to be leaving the earth and they cannot go to where he is going to be going. Now that statement created all kinds of questions. It created a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern and a lot of confusion. Because up until this time, the disciples were totally dependent upon the strength and the security of Jesus' presence. Remember, these guys had left everything to follow him. All of their security was found in being with Jesus. The thought, so the thought of living life without his physical presence was, was more than they could handle. And so knowing that their hearts were troubled, Jesus tells them in John chapter 14, verse 16, he says this, he says, I'm going to ask my father... And he is going to give another helper to you to be with you forever. In other words, Jesus says, I'm going to send someone else in my place who is going to help you. And whoever believes in him will not only do the works that he's been doing, but he's actually going to do greater works. Now, you talk about creating some confusion here. You talk about creating some questions. How in the world were the disciples going to make it in a culture that was already hostile towards anyone who claimed to be a follower of Jesus. And how in the world would they actually do greater things knowing that he was going to be leaving? This didn't even make any sense to them. Well, you get into John chapter 15 and Jesus begins to lay it out for them. He gives them a picture of how this whole thing is actually going to work after he is gone. He actually changes the way in which they would relate to him in his absence. And... At the very same time, he gives us a very encouraging picture of how that relationship is going to be formed in us today. Well, in John chapter 15, verse 1, let's start reading together. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does, not, that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then he says this in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Now I'm just wondering, how many, how many of you are gardeners out there? You, you either have you grow vegetables or fruit or flowers? Anybody? Okay. How many farmers? Anybody? Any farmers out there? Okay. We had some farmers in the first service, so no farmers in this one, I don't think. But Jesus is saying this. I mean, you're going to love this if you're into gardening. All right. He says, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. In other words, he's the gardener. And you, talking to his disciples, he says, you're the branchers. In other words, we are joined together, but we're not the same. 
But the thing that connects us to each other, all right, the thing is the thing that comes from the vine and nourishes the branch. In a tree, we know it's the sap. The sap flows from the vine and into the branch. The branch actually draws its life from the vine. Now, what has Jesus just promised to his followers? He's promised them a helper. He's he's promised them a Holy Spirit. We draw our life from the Holy Spirit as we stay connected to Jesus Christ. And the word that Jesus uses here to describe that connection is the word abide. Abide means to remain or to stay or to dwell. Author Warren Wearsby says, to abide means to keep in fellowship with Christ so that his life can work in and through us to produce fruit. And Jesus says this, he says, if you want power in your life, if you want to get rid of that that barren, dry, thirsty state that you're living in, he says, stay close to me. Stay connected to me. Draw your life from me. Abide in me. Now, how can we know How can we know that we're abiding in Christ? Well, what what are some of the the characteristics of a life that abides? Well, Jesus begins to lay it out for us. He says, first of all, that person will bear spiritual fruit. Look again at verse 5. He says, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Now, according to Jesus, our job as branches is to stay connected to the vine so that the Holy Spirit can fill us and flow out of our lives. When the Holy Spirit is overflowing out of our lives, Jesus says the result of that will be fruit. Now, don't miss what I'm about to say next. This is really important. As we abide in Jesus, our role is to bear fruit, not to produce fruit. You get that? As we abide in Jesus, our role, our job is not to, it's not to produce fruit, it's just simply to bear fruit. In other words, fruit happens. As I hang out with Jesus, the natural byproduct of that relationship is going to be fruit. Now, notice that Jesus never calls us to be fruit producers. In other words, it's not on us to create or to generate spiritual fruit in our lives. I can't do it, and neither can you. Now, I want to give you three characteristics of spiritual fruit, and I've got, I got this from Tony Evans. Okay? First of all, it reflects the character of the tree. Apples come from apple trees, oranges come from orange trees. The fruit in your life should reflect Christ. His attitudes, his actions, his character, and his conduct. Okay? The second thing is fruit is visible. The presence of fruit lets you identify the tree's kind and whether or not it's healthy. A fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ is a visible follower of Jesus Christ, not a secret agent kind of Christian. And fruit is not just One of the signs that you're abiding in Jesus, it is the sign. Okay? It is the sign. Number three, fruit is always for the benefit of others. If you're always serving yourself instead of others, your fruit is going to rot on the tree because it wasn't given to you for the benefit of you. When you're around someone who is truly abiding Jesus and bearing fruit, you're just going to know it. How, How will I know it? What does that fruit look like? Well, The Bible actually talks about spiritual fruit in a lot of different places, but I want to look at two verses in the book of Galatians. The Apostle Paul talks about spiritual fruit, and here's what he says about it. He says that the fruit of the Spirit is this. It is love, it is joy, it is peace, it is patience, it is kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then he says, against such things there is no law. In other words, no one would ever make a law to prohibit such behavior. So if you are bearing spiritual fruit in your life, your life is going to reflect the life of Jesus Christ, his attitudes, his actions, his character, and his conduct. Years ago, I think it was back in 1994, I grabbed hold of a book by Charles Stanley, one of my favorite pastors. He wrote a book called The Wonderful Spirit-Filled Life. And it, it really, I mean, I had been through seminary, Bible college, grew up in the church. It just helped unlock the Holy Spirit for me in a way that I'd never really truly understand. And in that, in that book, he gives us a practical understanding of how the fruit of the Spirit would play out in our lives. He says, you're going to have love for those that do not love in return. You're going to have joy in the midst of painful circumstances. Peace when something you are counting on doesn't come through. Patience when things aren't going fast enough for you. Kindness towards those that treat you unkindly. Goodness towards those that 
have been intentionally insensitive to you, faithfulness when friends have proved unfaithful, gentleness towards those who have handled you roughly, and self-control in the midst of intense temptation. When you abide in Jesus, that's the fruit that the Holy Spirit will actually begin to produce in your life. Now, people that abide in Jesus are not perfect people. They don't live in a spiritual cocoon, isolated from the world that is going on around them. They, they have occasional mess-ups and blow-ups just like everyone else. They still love, live with daily bouts of temptation. They still struggle with sin. But here's what sets them apart from everyone else. Their response. When circumstances take a spirit-filled abider down from the count, they, they have some downtime, but they don't stay down long. When someone who abides in Jesus is done wrong, they experience hurt and frustration like everyone else, but they don't live in a world of revenge and bitterness. They're able to look at all that's going on through different eyes because Jesus Christ is living his life out through them through the power of the Holy Spirit that is producing spiritual fruit in them. So a life that abides is going to bear fruit. Now here's another way that we know, that we can know that we're abiding in Christ. We're going to experience the Father's lifting up and pruning. Look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. God's goal for every Christian is not just to bear fruit, but to increase in fruit bearing. We're, we are to progress from producing no fruit to some fruit to more fruit to much fruit to remaining fruit. Okay? Why? Because God wants you to live a fruitful, productive life for the good of others and for his glory. Now look again at verse 2 because I want to define a, a word and a term for you. This is really important. When Jesus uses the term every branch. He is referring to Christians because Jesus says that these are branches that are in him. That is important to remember who Jesus is talking about here. Otherwise, you're going to misinterpret what he's about to say next. The Greek words take away, carry with it an idea of a branch in a vineyard or a garden that oftentimes will get so heavy that it will begin to drag the ground. So God the gardener, he takes them away. How? From the ground by lifting them up. You ever seen a, a branch just get so heavy it just starts dragging on the ground? Well, in this context, God the gardener comes along, takes them away by lifting it up. How does he do that? Well, for us, sometimes by the word, sometimes by corporate worship, sometimes just by other people encouraging us. But God also prunes branches so that they'll bear more fruit. How does he do that? Well, sometimes God will allow trials and challenges to come into our lives to help us to shake off or to get rid of anything that is hindering us from growing in our faith or keeping us from reaching our full potential. Now, I know it's hard not to think of pruning in negative terms because sometimes pruning is painful. But sometimes God will prune away good things in our lives so that we will have room to experience the very best things. And Jesus says that one of God's main pruning agents is his word. Look at verse 3. As Jesus is talking to his disciples, he says this to them. He says, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. In other words, the word of God has the power to convict us and cleanse us as we're listening to it, as we're reading it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want to skip over this next verse because it's important and it's been misinterpreted over the years. All right? And before I read it, I want to say this to you. Sometimes it's easy for us to read a verse, to pull it out, and to misinterpret it because oftentimes we don't read it in the context of all the other verses around it. Sometimes we don't look at the audience in which it's spoken to or we don't look at the whole story that's going on and we don't look at what was going on in culture at the time that it was spoken. And this is one of those verses that it's easy to do that. Let me read it and let me explain it. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Now, does that mean that these branches lose their relationship to the vine and are thrown into a literal fire? In other words, is Jesus saying that those who don't abide in him lose their salvation and then are cast into hell? No. Now, remember, these are branches that Jesus says belong to the vine. They belong to Jesus. They are in him. And we know that we are eternally secure 
because we know that you cannot lose your salvation. And another thing we need to do when we get verses like this is we need to look at verses in the other places in Scripture. They go, hmm, can we lose our? No, because this verse says this, and verse, this verse says this, and this verse says this. So here's what Jesus is saying here. If you stay disconnected from the vine for too long, don't be surprised when you find yourself experiencing God's hand of discipline. Don't be surprised when you see your spiritual life begin to wither. Getting burned here is a reference to a loss of fellowship with Jesus and a loss of rewards from God. It's a life that becomes barren and dry and purposeless. Now, what do I do when I find myself in a place like this? You repent and you come back. When you find yourself in a, in a season of just thirsty because you're so barren and dry and life it just feels like there's a void inside you. you repent and you come back we spent a whole series on this draw near jesus james says in verse uh, chapter 4 verse 8 draw near to god and he'll draw near to you so a life that abides is bearing fruit it's going to experience the father's lifting up and pruning but We're also going to see answered prayers. Look at verse 7. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now let me explain how that works. If I'm staying closely connected to Jesus, and I'm not, listen, I'm not just reading and hearing his word, but I'm meditating on it. I am internalizing it. I'm letting it shape my life and I'm obeying it. Then my prayers are going to be answered. Why? Because when I abide in Jesus and I allow his words to abide in me, I will begin to align the will of my life with his will. I will begin to pray his will. I am praying the things that he wants me to pray. And that's powerful because prayer is how God gets things done in this world. You may be sitting at a crossroads in your life with with no answers for what to do next. You You may be at a moment in your life where you have lost vision for your future or you just feel stuck. I love this quote from Pastor uh, author Mark Batterson. He says, our biggest problems are only solved in the presence of God. God ideas are revealed in the presence of God. Prayer is the difference between the best you can do and the best that God can do. When we sit in God's presence, meditating on his word, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to us that God wants us to know. He will give us God ideas for our lives, for our families, and for our future. And as he does, as he does we then begin to pray those things, and then he, begin, he begins to answer those things. But it's all about abiding. It's all about abiding. So we're bearing fruit. We're being lifted up. We're being pruned. We're seeing prayers answered, but we're also experiencing a deeper Love for Christ and for others. Look at verse 9. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. He says in verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now here's the command. Jesus says, Abide in my love. How do we do that? Jesus tells us. He says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. In other words, love for Jesus will result in obedience. And obedience produces a deeper relationship with Jesus. And then Jesus says in verse 10 that he wants us to experience and enjoy the same kind of intimate, loving relationship with him that he has with his own father. And he says the key, the key to his own intimacy with his father is obedience to his father's commands. Now, Jesus goes back to something here. He goes back to something that he actually said in John 13, 34, to remind these these disciples and to remind us about a very specific command that he's referring to here. Look at verse 12. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Now, do you ever get the feeling that love is a big deal to God? Because he talks about it a lot. I mean, you, he, he talks about it over and over again. I remember in the first few months of this church, I had someone walk up to me and go, you're one of those guys. And I mean, they just walked up and said, you're, you're one of those guys, aren't you? And I went, what are you talking about? Oh, you just talk about God's love all the time. You need to preach more about sin. You just talk about God's love all the time. And I, and I'm, and I said, well, the reason I do is because God talks about love all the time throughout the Bible. 
I mean, it's, it's in there a lot. The love that Jesus is referring to here is more than emotions and feelings and personal preferences. It's about a decision. It's, it's about choosing to love people as Jesus loves us, to compassionately, responsibly, self-sacrificially seek the well-being of another person. You can love someone that you may not necessarily like because love is not dependent on your feelings. That's why Jesus can command us to even love our enemies. And I think the greatest challenge that Christians have faced over the past few years has been this. How do I love people that I passionately disagree with? How do I love my fellow Christ followers who are sitting in the same service with me at Westridge that I passionately disagree with? How do I love people that don't share the same political views that I do? How do I love people that don't share all my views on racial matters? How do I love people that don't share all my views concerning all of the COVID protocols or matters concerning immigration or matters concerning poverty or matters concerning gay rights or transgender issues and so on and so on and so on and so on? Here's how so many professed Christians have responded the last few years. Anger, hatred, bitterness, rage, attack, cancel. And yet here's what our master, our savior, our teacher, our redeemer, our king, Jesus commands us to do. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. He actually says in verse 8, This is how I will know that you are my disciple. This is how I know that we're in fellowship. This is how I know that we are tight, that that we're in step with one another, that you follow my commands, that you love others as much as I love you. Not that you like everyone, but that you love them. Now, here's a question. Does that mean that I have to welcome back into my life people who have genuinely hurt me and that continue to hurt me, or, or people that continue to just be a challenge for me. No. There are people in my life that I I literally have to hold out there, not only for my own safety, but for my own emotional well-being, but I still love them dearly, and I would probably fight for them. But Jesus says, love one another as I've loved you. Listen, that's a tall order. How do we do that? We abide. We stay connected to the vine, Jesus, and we allow the Holy Spirit to flow from his life to ours. So, Here's the life that abides. We're bearing fruit. We're being lifted up and pruned. We're seeing prayers answered. Our love for God and others is is being deepened as we walk in obedience. But here's another result of abiding. I love this. We will will experience joy. Look at verse 11. These things, Jesus says, I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus says, here's my goal for teaching you all of this so that you will be full of joy. Now, what is joy? Here's what Tony Evans, here's how he describes it. I love this. He says, joy is the internal stability. Joy is internal stability in spite of external circumstances because of the knowledge that God is in control. Now, remember what's happening at this moment when Jesus is is, is teaching here. He has told his disciples that he is leaving them and they cannot go with him. So Jesus is saying to them, Here's how you can have internal stability when everything around you seems to be out of control. He says, stay close to me. Abide in me, and I will fill you with joy. Now, notice that Jesus offers them some of his own joy. In other words, if your joy container is empty, Jesus says he will let you borrow some of his. That's a great word. And then finally, and I love this, Here's how we can know that we're abiding in Jesus. We will experience friendship with Jesus. This is so good. Don't miss this now. Look at verse 14. Jesus says, you're my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. He says, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus says there's a special distinction for those who choose to abide in me. He says, they're my friends. The relationship has changed. I don't don't call you servants any longer. He says, from here on out, I call you friends. And here's the benefit of our friendship. I will tell you everything that the Father has shared with me. In other words, you become an insider. 
Okay? You, you get inside scoops that outsiders and non-abiders don't get. Now, I've told you this many times. You know that I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, my brother Kevin is uh, four years younger than me. But he and I, when we were home together after school, we would wait every single day for the Detroit newspaper to be delivered to our house. It was back in the day when people would ride a bike down the street, they would reach into a bag, and they would chuck a newspaper at your house. And when that newspaper came at our house, we literally would race each other outside the house, all right, elbows flying sometimes to get to that paper. Why? It wasn't the money section. It was the sports section. Because we have a deep love for Detroit sports teams. And this is way, way before the Internet, before you could have an app and you can pull up all the stuff on the phone anytime you want it, all right? But now, now we get all of our, our, our Detroit sports info on the Detroit News app. But here's the catch. Here's the catch. The latest and best articles can only be read by inside subscribers. You have to subscribe, and it's 99 cents a month, and it just drives me crazy. It's irritating, okay? Now... He's a subscriber, and I'm not. But here's what I do know, okay? A few years ago, we both did the Ancestry DNA thing, and we're both Scottish. We're Scottish, right? But I'm 1% more Scottish than he is. Scottish people are known as being very frugal, which explains the, why I won't spend the 99 cents per month that he will, okay? But, but, but here's when we get together, he has all the scoops. He can read. I'm like, he goes, you read that article? And no, I can't get to it because I'm not an insider. Oh, well, let me tell you what it says. It's like he's beat me. He's like he's, he's beat me outside the door to the newspaper. He's got the sports section first. Listen, when we stay close to Jesus and abide in him, you become an insider. And you get all the best information that you'll ever need for any and every issue of life, and it comes to you right on time, right when you need it. So let me review everything I just said to you. Think about this for a moment. When we abide in Christ... We will bear fruit. We'll be lifted up and pruned for our good and for God's glory. We'll experience answered prayers. Our love for God and for others will deepen as we walk in obedience. And we'll experience full joy and Jesus will call us our friend. However, what can we expect when we're not abiding in Jesus? Look at verse 5. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, I decided for the sake of this morning's teaching to look up the definition of nothing in the Oxford Dictionary. Here's what it says. Not a single thing. Okay? Just, if, just in case you were wondering. Here's the truth. A branch that's disconnected from the vine is useless. It produces nothing. And ultimately, it withers up and it faces the harsh reality of losing fellowship and intimacy and blessings and the rewards of staying close to Jesus. Listen to me closely now. Even though those of you who are watching online, I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. You cannot, avoid, you cannot avoid Jesus all week and then connect with him for one hour on Sunday morning and expect all the benefits of a life that abides every single day. It just doesn't work that way. And that's why some of you today are feeling empty and barren and dry and maybe even useless because you're trying to do life apart from Jesus. So, how can we make sure that we're abiding? I want to give you two things. First thing, total dependence. Learning to abide in Christ begins when we are absolutely and thoroughly convinced that we can do nothing apart from him. Until that truth completely grips the core of who we are, we will never experience the full-blown power of the Holy Spirit in our lives because we'll always be trying to make our life work out in, in our own strength. Always. Abiding in Jesus is not a checklist. It's a way of life. It's a lifestyle. It's a state of being. It's a, it's a constant state of connection and just total dependence. And here's the second thing. Total surrender. Total dependence, total surrender. Dependence and surrender, they go hand in hand because we can't fully surrender our will to God until we are fully convinced that, that we cannot live effectively and powerfully and joyfully apart from intimacy and fellowship with Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you my default. Here's my default. 
My default is self-sufficiency. You want to know why? Because of my pride. Sometimes I think I can do this all on my own. But God has shown me that he has a very loving and sometimes painful way of bringing me back to the vine because he wants to hang out with me. Now, back when COVID started, um, Amy and I decided, you know what? I'm home a little bit more than a normal here, and everybody's home more than normal. So there are some things at home that we, we've talked about doing that we want to do. And one of those things that we decided we wanted to do was to build in our backyard a fire pit. And so we had this guy in our church who does this stuff for a living. So I called him on the phone. I said, hey, Chad, can you come over? Here's our dream, our idea for this fire pit. And so he came over with his crew, and he built this fire pit in our backyard. And we went up and bought, Amy and I went up and bought six of these Adirondack chairs for our fire pit. We have a fire bowl in the middle, and it's all gravel, and it's just really nice. And we bought six, one for me, one for Amy, one for Taylor, Zach, and we knew there were two girls coming into our world. So we have six chairs. I want to I just, if I could, show you an example just of what, for me personally, what it means to abide in Jesus. So many mornings over the last couple of years, I get up, and uh, if it's chilly or whatever, sometimes it's not. I'll build a fire, and I'll go out in the backyard, and, and I, have, I have my bag with me that's always full of my stuff. And I like to think that if Jesus were here today in person, he would sit down in one of my Adirondack chairs with me around my fire pit, and we would just hang out together. He wouldn't come and bring a throne down from heaven. He would just go, hey, let me, let me pull up one of these Adirondack chairs, and let me just sit and hang with you. And, and so when I go and I sit down at that, in my fire bowl, I always think to myself that I am sitting at the feet of Jesus. And as I'm sitting at his feet, I am totally dependent upon him, and I'm totally surrendered to him. And I have all my stuff. Listen, I, 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 bring, I bring my Bible because it's God's Word is still powerful, still speaking to me, still convicting me, still cleansing me, and, and I'll read that. And I have my, my journal because I journal my thoughts and my prayers. And sometimes I just sit there and I listen and I write down what I feel like God's telling me. And I'm, usually I have a book with me. Right now I'm, I just finished this book by Dane Ortland, Gentle and Lowly, The Heart and Christ for Sinners and Subs. What a good book, by the way. And uh, I, I have a highlighter and I have a pen. And sometimes I'll bring... Always, actually, I bring my little, little, what do they say, ear pods, iPod, I don't know what they're called. You stick them in your ear. They're pods. And I, and I just, because I, I, I get connected to God through worship music, and sometimes I'll just sit there and listen to worship music. And, but for, for me and for you, I just want you to know abiding is not running on, out of here and getting on a treadmill. And going off and just trying so hard to please and produce. It's just about being. It's about staying. It's about dwelling. And as I sit in the presence and at the feet of Jesus, sometimes I just, it's like I just lean over. Sometimes I put my head in his lap. I say, Lord, I am so dependent on you right now. Because I'm leading your church. Sometimes I don't know what to do, but you do because it's your church. And I'm reminding you that this is your deal. Lord, these are your people. And so I'm just putting that, Lord, I'm dependent upon you because apart from you, Lord, I can do nothing. So I'm reminding you of your very own words. I am dependent on you for all of these things, just for anything, even when I get up to speak. And then, Lord, I surrender to you. I surrender my anxieties and my worries and my fears and my doubts and just not knowing what the next 10 years of my life will hold. Lord, I just surrender all of that to you. And that's how I start off every single morning. But, but I don't walk away from that and just leave it all there. I just, I carry that with me all through the day. Because abiding in Jesus is not just a, it's not a place. It's just a constant state of being reminding myself all through the day that I am surrendered to him, that I'm dependent upon him, that I cannot do this apart from him. Now, 
I know that maybe for some of you right now, you're sitting here, you're listening to me going, you know, Brian, honestly, th this whole, I don't, I don't think I like this whole sound of total dependence and surrender. Because honestly, I like being in charge of my own life. I, I like calling the shots. I like independence. I mean, quite honestly, dependence and surrender sound kind of wimpy to me. All that fruit stuff you're talking about, that sounds wimpy as well. Let me ask you if you can identify with any of these words. Hateful, discouraged, stressed out, impatient, rude, insensitive, backstabbing, rough around the edges, and controlled by passions. Not a very attractive list, is it? I mean, if you owned a business, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hire anybody that had those characteristics, would you? If you had a daughter, you wouldn't want someone who was described by those words marrying your daughter, would you? And yet those words represent the exact opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And think about all those words for a moment. They're all relational by nature. That means they make a person more attractive and more joyful to be around. They make for better marriages. They make for better work relationships. They make for better parent-child relationships. Honestly, when you think about all that, you can't lose, can you? And it all comes from pursuing and hanging out and abiding with Jesus. So what is keeping you today from being totally dependent and totally surrendered to Jesus? The invitation's clear. Jesus is inviting you. He's inviting you just to hang out with him. He's inviting you to, to stay close. He's, in, he's inviting you to abide. And the benefits are amazing. You can't go wrong. It is the beginning of what Jesus describes in John 10, 10, is the abundant life, truly living a life that abides in Jesus. It begins, it begins, and it continues at that moment of total dependence and total surrender. I'm going to ask you to bow your head for just a moment, if you would. You may have walked in here today. We were talking earlier about the, just being barren and dry. Maybe feeling a bit disconnected at the moment, powerless, purposeless. There's a void in your heart at the moment, even though you know you are a branch, you are a follower of Christ. What is it right now that is making you feel that way? What is it? What is, what, what's in your life right now that has created that disconnect? Maybe it's your busyness. Maybe it's the schedule of your kids. Maybe there's something else in your life that's just totally grabbed your attention and your affections and your, your love and heart is drift, it drifts that way. And it's created inside of you this bit of staleness and you, you to be honest you miss you miss the closeness you, you miss the intimacy you miss being at the feet of Jesus being an insider experiencing the fruit of the spirit this very moment if that's where you are here's what you do repent change your mind and confess it to the Lord and come back and God will welcome you Jesus will welcome you with open arms that sap will begin to flow freely once again. It's like the power will come back on. It's like the lights get turned back on. The fellowship, the joy, the intimacy. Not perfection, not harder work. It's just a state of being and bearing, remaining. And if that's where you are, just confess it. Bring it to the Lord. Name it. Tell God you're sorry. Humble yourself and come back. If you're here today and Maybe you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You are not a vine. You are not a branch. You know it. You've never been connected to the vine. God is offering you that moment. He's offering you this invitation, this opportunity to have this connection. To have the Holy Spirit of God flowing through your life, giving your life power and purpose and meaning. Giving you an eternity in heaven. You've never made that decision before. And you know that there's a complete disconnect between you and God. I want to invite you into that right now. Just say in your heart, Lord Jesus, at this moment, I put all of my faith and all of my trust in you. I humble my heart right now. 
I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior. What Jesus Christ did for me on the cross was enough to pay for all of my sins. And I put all of my trust and my faith in you, Jesus. You are the vine. I want to know the Father. So thank you for inviting me to be a branch. And Lord, I trust that today from here on out, we are connected through the power of the Holy Spirit. If that's the decision that you're making right now, we're going to tell you what to do next, but I want to just welcome you. I want to welcome you into the garden. I want to welcome you into a relationship with Jesus Christ and God the Father in heaven and His Holy Spirit. Father, as we close, just in, right now as we sing, I pray, Father, that we'll lean in like never before because, Lord, when we hear your word, our response is worship. When we know that you're speaking to us and you're, you're lifting us up or pruning us, Lord, our response is worship, and that's what we want to do right now. So I want you to stand to your feet right now. I want to ask you not to leave. We're going to sing this song that's so good, so powerful called Build My Life. It's so good for what, we're, what we just heard. And I want to just, if you know the song, sing out with all your heart. If you don't, just lean and listen, meditate on it, and let it speak to your heart right now, Lord. Speak to us right now. Do a work in this place, we pray in Jesus' name. of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Lord, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Come on, just tell them today. steps on both sides with people over here. I want to grab some people, elders, pastors, directors, if you get over there. You just want to come this morning, and for you, sitting at the feet of Jesus might just be coming and getting on your knees at these steps and just bringing all of your stuff and just completely surrendering and saying, Lord, this moment, from here on out, I want to live a life of total dependence and surrender. I want to just ask you to come. You may want to sit down at your chair and just make that commitment right now, but if you want to do that, this is a place for you to do that, and there is freedom in this place, and we'll stay as long as we need to this morning because there's nothing more important in the world that's happening than what's happening in this church at this very moment. So if God is moving in your heart right now, 
and you want to just make a symbolic gesture and say, Lord, I'm going to move out of this chair. I'm going to go get on my knees because I'm not going to live another moment in this barren, dry state that I'm in. I want to abide. And then move out of your chair and let's get on your knees and let's just pray to the Lord right now as we go back into this song. Pull it all down today. Mm. We want to abide in you, Jesus. can have a seat. Well, that's what you call church. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's so good. If you are here still doing business with God, uh, just feel free to stay if you if you feel led to do that. You are more than welcome to continue to come down. These stairs are open for you, and we are here for you. We've been praying for you all week. We've been thinking about you all week, as many as we can by name, just asking that God would move in your heart and just give you what you need. Um, as brothers and sisters and family and friends and guests. So whether you're here in person or you're watching online, we've been praying for you. You know, today you may have made a decision. One of the decisions that you may have made today was to follow Brian's leader, to become a fully devoted follower for the first time in your life, to give your heart and life to Jesus, to become a Christian. It's the first time you've ever said that or thought that in your mind. I want to give my life to you, Jesus. I want to be a Christian. I want to be your follower. Or you may have made a decision. We just, a spiritual decision today, just said, you know what, there's something specific that I need to be obedient in. That God is calling me into a decision to move forward in a specific area of my life that I need to make a turning point and be obedient. And for either one of those things, can I just say this to you? You are not meant to make those decisions and walk that new path that God is leading to you on your own. You're not meant to do that. It's why we are here. It's why we've been praying for you. It's why we've been praying for you as a pastoral staff, as a staff, um, as elders, as group leaders, as just a church, because we're here for you. And so here's what I would love for you to do. I'd love for you to text the word follow. And if you do that, it'll just open up a conversation that we can have with you just to know how we can help you take your next step so that you're not taking it in isolation and you're not taking it alone. 
And that's so important. It is. It really is. I hope you'll do that. Well, we have such a generous church. It was so fun for me to talk with Jim earlier about the Vision Fund. But we also talk um, and we have what we call our tithes and offerings, our regular giving to our general fund. And that's what kind of keeps the ministry that we do day in and day out for the sake of our church and for the community that we do, that we know God is calling us to. And if you are new to that, you haven't given before, the way that you can join the rest of us uh, is the, we have three ways you can do that, whether you're online or in person. And if you happen to be here today, there's another way, a bonus way that you can give because our host team will be at the doors. They'll be holding buckets and you can give that way as well. You know, I've mentioned already, you know, the church that we pray for you. If you're watching online, we pray for you. We really do. Um, we get on our knees and we ask God to bless you. And again, as many of you as by name as we can think of throughout, you know, different days and different times of the year and whatever, as many as we can. Because God has put something in our heart He's put a love in our heart for you. We don't, maybe we don't even know you by name. Maybe we don't, maybe we've never had the opportunity of crossing paths with you, but God has put a love in our heart as Christians for one another. And so when we dismiss um, from our different gatherings, we always say, you know, Westridge Church and our friends and guests, you're loved. That's why, because God has put love in our heart for you. It's his love that he's given to you. So here's what the message is today. Westridge Church, you're loved. Your love. We hope you have a great week. I really hope your bracket works out. You know, Godspeed on all of that. We'll see you guys next Sunday. Be great this week, everybody.